Oh, hello everybody. This is a, a rather unusual uh, symposium conversation that we're having. It's the first time that we've had to do them uh, remotely like this. We'd normally be doing this in a lovely spot at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. But anyway, this is the occasion of the, and I have to look this up, it's the 85th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Positive Biology that began way back in, in 1933. And the topic this year is biological timekeeping. Um, and I think this topic exemplifies what Reginald Harris, the founder of the, uh, of the symposium wanted. He said they were to consider a given biological problem from the chemical, physical, and mathematical, as well as from its biological aspects. And I think that fits biological uh, rhythms and timekeeping is very exemplifies that approach. So we have here uh, this morning and for, for Ria this afternoon, uh, Ria Antonio Curignotti. Yeah. I promised her I wouldn't mangle her name, but, uh, from the John Innes Centre in, in Norwich in England. Um, Ria, let's. Uh, why don't we? Why don't we start by? Can you just give me a few sentences about the general topic that you work on? So I actually work on biological timing, but in terms of the season. So it's, I work on plants and many plants like to flower in spring. And so I work to understand how they get the environmental cues and measure time over winter to make sure that they flower in spring. So this is, is this the process that's called vernalization? Exactly, yes. So this is the need for plants to have it, to, ex, to experience some period of cold. Exactly, so they need a, a long period of cold will accelerate their flowering. And this is so that they are sure that they've experienced winter um, and then they will respond to photoperiod signals in spring. Uh, but actually the photoperiod is the same in autumn and in spring. So to make sure it's spring uh, and not autumn, they need to remember that winter's passed in between. Um, so you are exploring the the mechanisms of of this of this phenomena. How does a how does a plant remember, or uh, and and how does it count a period of cold? Exactly. Yes. So. Um, well, one of the mechanisms that plants use to remember is an epigenetic mechanism. And actually, that's the, the main focus of the lab where I work, which is um, I work with uh, Professor Caroline Dean and Professor Martin Howard at the John Innes Center. Uh, and they have a great collaboration working on this problem, um, which is combining mathematical modeling and experimental biology. And so I also work a little bit with both. And there's a key gene which is called FLC, the flowering locus C, which actually um, it has a, a, it can have an epigenetically silent state. And so the cold sort of triggers this rare event of switching from a non-state to an off state, but this happens uh, differently uh, independently in each of the cells of the plant. So actually each cell will decide I've had long enough in the cold now, I'm going to switch off. And when enough of the cells have made this decision, or as more of them make this decision, then we have a gradual reduction at the whole plant level of FLC. And so then that allows uh, the, the whole plant's FLC level to be low enough to then allow um, flowering because FLC is a repressor of flowering. And so uh, this actually uh, allows the plant to remember because it's much easier for each cell to remember, am I on or am I off, rather than having to remember exactly, it's been three weeks in the cold or something like that. But actually my work has been on something a little bit different where actually each cell does remember how long it's been. Um, and we actually found that um, because there's another gene that's involved in this process, which doesn't have any memory, but it does count during the cold. And then it kind of passes on uh, this signal to FLC to help it switch off. So it switches off uh, more faster as the cold progresses effectively. So, um, and the way that the plant is doing this counting of time in the cold is it's sort of, um, it's a little bit complicated. So, 
there's a protein that is sort of being produced all the time in the plant. Uh, but because the plant is growing more slowly in the cold than in the warm, it starts to accumulate in the cold. And, and so it accumulates more and more as time progresses. And that's sort of used to count time uh, in the cold. But, but you say that that protein accumulates gradually over time and affects FLC or, or it is exactly. suppression. But how does the plant know how does the plant know to increase to let that protein gradually accumulate? So it's really it's really happening through its growth rate. So plants actually ah. it's it's well known that plants grow more slowly in the cold than they do in the warm, um, and this this has uh, other purposes in the plant, but it actually it's been hijacked by this process as a way to create a counting mechanism actually. Mm. Uh, what what are the what are the functions does this uh, does this protein have? So uh, it's actually been involved uh, in salt stress in the past, but uh, in our case we found that it uh, highly uh, upregulates two genes that we know are cold responsive. So we think it's really also part of the cold response, but that maybe hasn't been seen before because it's really the protein itself that has this response rather than the expression of the gene, which is the easy thing to check. When you're looking for temperature responsive genes, you usually check the gene expression rather than the protein levels. But actually for this particular protein, it's the pro well, for this gene, it's the protein level that changes. So the, 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 the gene expression of this protein remains more or less mm -hmm. constant. Yes, so it doesn't respond to temperature exactly. So I, I, I struggle a bit with this because one seems to get into an infinite regression. So what, what is it? So the, how is it that that protein accumulates? I mean, it's not degraded at the same rate? Or? So it's not, it's not degraded very much at all, actually. So it's a very, very stable protein that doesn't seem to be degraded in the warm or in the cold, but it's just diluting every time the plant grows mm. a bit, it gets diluted. Oh, of course, because you, yes, you said about the, the fact that the plant is not growing is a, is a, exactly. a crucial part it's of it. It's being this. made, but it's not being degraded. And so the only way to decrease the concentration is through the growth of the plant. But when that slot suddenly stops, it starts to uh, concentrate it and uh, accumulate, yeah. And I noticed that um, you are in the, computational and systems biology grouping yes. at, uh, at John Innes. Um, because I, I clearly you've now got rate of protein accumulation, rate of FLC suppression, mm -hmm. rate of growth of the, of the plant. Uh, presumably you've been trying to develop uh, mathematical models to- uh, Exactly. Yes, yeah, so this is actually how, um, how we got to this mechanism, because we were trying to make a model to explain the, the FLC shutdown uh, in natural conditions. So we started off, we had quite a lot of uh, knowledge of what's happening to this gene at different constant temperature conditions. And we wanted to say, can we explain, combining all this information in the model, can we explain what's happening in the field? So we took the plants and we really put them out in. Uh, fields in Sweden and over here in Norwich. And then we tested, you know, with, with our understanding from our model, can we explain what's going on? And we actually found that, no, <laughs> um, fluctuations in the temperature are actually a very important signal for the plants. So we can't understand uh, what's going on just based on constant temperatures. And also that's related to the fact that the fluctuations um, are related to the circadian rhythms as well. So because of course the natural fluctuations do have their own diurnal rhythm usually, right? The, the high temperatures are in the day. So we found that to be able to explain what we're seeing in the field, we, we then did some experiments looking at specific temperature profiles to try and take apart um, what's the circadian part of the regulation and what is just the extreme temperatures that are having some effect and we found that we needed at least five separate temperature sensitive inputs into this process. And so then we wanted to, so some of them were responding to cold nights, some of them were responding to freezing temperatures. Um, 
but then there was something that seemed to be ignoring everything else and just counting time in the cold. And then we really wanted to know what is that. So we then, when we found this, uh, that NTL8 was involved somehow uh, in the regulation of these genes, we wanted to figure out which of these pathways is it part of. So we really found that it was doing this counting. And that was the thing that we were most interested in as well, because we wanted to understand long-term uh, sensing and measurements. So I think there, there are two things that I find interesting about that is that uh, I, I've always thought that modeling really, you don't get any, anything more out of it than you put in. But in this case, your modeling has led you to see not a flaw, but that there was a gap in your... Exactly. In yes. Your so so that, that's actually what I think is the most exciting thing uh, about modeling. It's you sort of, you say, this is what we know. Can it explain things? and you find what's missing. You see that you know there's bits in your understanding that either are not specific enough or you can't distinguish between two possibilities or you never even thought that there were these two possibilities. Mm -hmm. And when you start to make the model, you start to find this. And then when it doesn't agree with your data, you realize there's still something missing. So you go again. And this was really the kind of thing that we did, trying to build more and more uh, of our knowledge into it and then getting going out to get more of this knowledge. For example, when we're trying to understand about NTL8, we didn't initially know that it was a stable protein, but the model told us that for it to have this kind of slow accumulation, it must be a stable protein. So then we checked the gradation rate and it, it was a stable protein. So it's really making you see these, these key questions that you might not have found straight away otherwise. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that struck me, what you just said, that um, you found the plants responded differently Growing in growing in the wild, or uh, compared with your laboratory experiments. Yeah. Well, actually, you're you're using what are you using Arabidopsis in all. Yes. Yes. The, exactly. Uh, so how I mean, how often do people carrying out plant research in the mm -hmm. laboratory plant yeah. their plants outside to see whether there are <laughs> things are different? Is the assumption that they go presumably as some just they're going to behave in exactly the same way indoors and outdoors. Yeah, I think that's let's say, maybe the naive assumption, but I think uh, lately there have been other groups also that have, have really wanted to do this uh, field experiment. So specifically a group um, that was actually mentioned by one of the other speakers. Um, so Ant Dodd is working uh, with Professor Kudo in Japan, and they're also doing experiments with uh, a different Arabidopsis species, but really in the in the field conditions. And because, you know, we, we realize that this is quite important. And there are uh, other studies that have also been carried out in Sweden in the same sites uh, where we're working, where they're really looking at this kind of effects. Mm -hmm. So because yes, it's a very important thing. I mean, we learn so much about the mechanism but there are all these other differences that we're not considering. For example, I mean, this is a very obvious one. You know, if you look at the kind of temperature profile that plants experience in the field, it has nothing to do with yes. what we give them in, in the chambers. Yes. It's like, it fluctuates more actually in, within one day, it can fluctuate more than let's say the average between, uh, you know, um, there's different seasons. So it's, it's a very intensely different profile, mm. I think. Mm. Um, so mentioning temperature fluctuations, uh, what what implications does your work have for for climate change? Exactly, that that's one of the things. Well, we started a little bit to look at, but we want to carry on a bit more with that. So the first thing, actually, what that we found is that the extreme temperatures were very key for this signal. So basically, every day that the temperature goes above for the plant that we're studying was about 15 degrees. So every day the temperature goes above 15 degrees is not counted as a winter day. And mm. so this can actually be quite important because for, I mean, our plant is, you know, Arabidopsis will eventually flower, especially the, the lab accessions. It's not really an issue, but the, it's definitely the, the case that with climate change, the time uh, of flowering is changing uh, for crops. And so the time of sowing is also changing accordingly to make up for that. Um, so we really want to understand how it will change as the climate changes further. 
uh, and so to make sure basically that the plants will get enough winter to be able to flower at the right time because that's that's the key thing about vernalization it has to be sure that winter has gone mm -hmm. so it has to have enough winter uh, winter days or winter period to to make the transition to flowering uh, but actually the other thing when we try to um, use some climate data some existing climate data to put into our model to try to make predictions based on that because we did eventually after we did all these additional experiments we got to a model that really worked and it could predict uh, what was happening in the field before we fed it the, the new data. We did the experiment in the field again and compared and we could predict what was going on. Um, so then we wanted to use climate projections to see what will happen in the future. But actually we really need to know uh, at a high time resolution what the temperature is because if you have a, a short term fluctuation even for an hour or so to a high temperature that can affect the output. And of course the climate models are so complicated the usual lab what you get is usually like the daily mean temperature or something like that and of course where the so usually it will be like one meter off the ground or something arabidopsis is not one meter off the ground so we want now to to try and get canopy temperatures at high resolution in these climate projections because that's what's going to be relevant to really predict how the plants will behave mm. so this is one of the things that i'm also interested in to look into in the future so in, in the last couple of minutes or so, are you, would it be possible to reset, um, reset the system genetically to have a protein that, hang on, you want it, you, if it's getting warmer, it's going to experience shorter periods of cold or less cold. Mm -hmm. So you would want, which way, which way would you want yes. that protein? So so go. you could uh, adjust the starting levels of the gene that needs to shut down to tell it how much cold it should expect. Mm -hmm. So so this is for sure the case uh, for Arabidopsis, and you can see in different natural accessions of Arabidopsis from different parts of the world, that's really the thing that's been changed by the plant. So they're all very robustly responding to winter, but how much winter they need is different in the different uh, accessions. And that's controlled by these starting levels, this uh, autumn levels of this gene FLC. Uh, but I mean, in other, in crops, for example, depending on the crop, that will be a little bit different. Um, so we'd have to know exactly what's happening. I mean, there's already quite a lot of knowledge, actually, for example, for, for wheat and brassicas actually have FLC. So then, um, but how to adjust exactly there is a little bit more complicated. And that's another thing that I'm very interested in. So, well, I, I'm, we should finish, and I'm going to finish with with, with another quote. This is actually from the um, the 2007 meeting on uh, on the biological rhythms. Uh, Michael Menneken's uh, final sentence in his summary: How do animals, plants, fungi, and bacteria make adaptive use of their biological clocks in the worlds in, in the worlds in which they live? Which I think perfectly sums up uh, uh, your work, Ria. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs>